welcome back to the Noob Show podcast. My name is Shrek. And I get to interview spearfishing experts, authorities, characters, legends from around the planet. Legends that love spearing. Today it's uh, off to Norway to interview Oistin. Oistin. I think I say his name wrong every time. Uh, his, he has a podcast called Have Conture. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that wrong too. Um, so, hey, join the party. If you want to go to Instagram.com forward slash H A V K O N T O R E T, you can check out his podcast. Uh, he's, it's in Norwegian for the most part. However, he speaks fantastic English and he's going to have some English interviews as well. So um, always great to have more people uh, creating awesome, just awesome podcasts around our, our, our shared passion. Um, so, hey, I hope you enjoyed today's interview. Fantastic, uh, amazing. It's an amazing destination. Norway is on many people's list as a bucket list destination to go spearing. And it's for good reason. Hey, um, before we get there, the Coffs Blue Water Classic is on this coming weekend. Friday the 17th is their briefing. Check it out. The Australian Blue Water Freedivers Classic. Check it out. Just type that into Google and look up the details. Get down there if you can. It's in Walgulga and uh, it's running over the Saturday and the Sunday. It's a fantastic comp and a bunch of legends will be down there. Um, also, Wherever you are in the world, if you want a copy of 99 Spare Recipes and maybe the noobspare.com website has got the shipping rates are a wee bit expensive for where you are, you're always welcome to go on Amazon.com and buy a copy there. Uh, it's up there in every country available. Amazon's fantastic for being able to um, get things to people far cheaper than the rest of us can. So check that out, Amazon.com, go to 99 Spare Recipes. Um, also, just want to say a massive thanks to the patron listeners powering this podcast if you're interested in supporting the show on an episode by episode basis go to patreon.com forward slash noob spiro join a bunch of other legends on there helping to put fuel in the noob spiro outboard hey let's go let's get into this episode oistin from norway uh, oistin oistin anyway here we go shop for your spearfishing gear at adreno.com.au in store and online, you can use the code NoobSpiro to save 20 bucks on any purchase, over $200. Why would you shop with Adreno, I hear you say? Well, <clears throat> let me lay it out. Flat rate shipping, $9.99 on all orders. Hassle-free returns policy. Australia, price match guarantee. Shop now, pay later with Afterpay. Fully sick brands. Huge, obnoxiously ginormous range of great spearfishing gear made just for legends like you. Go Adreno, go pro, don't be slow. Shop massive, spear and gear at Adreno. I'll stop, Shrek, that's a no-no. But seriously, shop with the Noob Spiro's longest running partner, Adreno. Head to adreno.com.au online or in-store at their huge mega stores. Use the code Noob Spiro to save 20 bucks on any purchase over $200. Are you US based, looking for free diving, spearfishing gear? Neptonics is the best. Their online website, so easy to use. If you've got any questions, Jerry and the team answer questions via phone, email. Anyway, they've got an easy contact form on the site. Uh, these guys are absolute legends. And uh, if they sell it, they believe in it, they back it, they use it themselves. It's tough gear that works. Visit neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10% on any order at neptonics.com. That's right. Use the code NOOB10, N-O-O-B-10 on your next order, save 10% at naptonics.com. This podcast is brought to you by aqualite.com.au. This is the best solution bar none for staying hydrated in the ocean. If you're a Spiro, it's an absolute no-brainer. It's a game changer. If you're doing extended trips and the cramp starts to set in and uh, the old body's telling you, hey, that's enough, just get hydrated and it will save you a whole heap of woe. It's a groundbreaking product that can help you to stay hydrated. It's got low sugar, it's less acidic than other options on the market, it's rapid absorption, help you to maintain performance. Dehydration of just one to 2% can affect your mental and physical performance by up to six or 7%. And as when you're spearfishing, you can tell when dehydration is starting to affect you because the equalization goes out the window. Get Aqualite at aqualite.com.au. It's scientific rehydration that Spiros know and trust. I know because one works there, and that's why we've set up this discount code for you. 10% off when you use the code NoobSpiro at aqualite.com.au. Check it out. Australian-made hydration products tailored 
for Spiros and a whole bunch of other people that suffer from dehydration too. But check it out at aqualite.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 10%. Mate, well, that's a perfect intro. So <laughs> I've got o- Oystein Sundland from the Havgontuga Hav- 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 yeah. podcast. <laughs> so it's a Norwegian podcast host. Uh, reached out to me yep. and, uh, mate, it's been great to make your acquaintance. We've been, I've been following you along for a little while. Um, yep. But catch us up. You live in Norway. Like these days it seems like Norway is like one of the premier – spearfishing destinations everyone's watched daniel mann's videos and you know yeah yeah from your neck of the woods and from further abroad it's like it's on everyone's bucket list these days so cool and welcome to the show thank you it's great to be uh be here tell us about listening to yeah sure norway has a really long coast it's uh i don't know exactly but it's uh it's really long uh, so there is a huge amount of places where you can go diving, and uh, there is uh, an abundance of fish. Usually, as farther, the further you go north, the more fish it is. So in the south now, there's not so much fish, like in the far south. Okay. But like from uh, from my hometown of Bergen and and north, it's uh, yeah, there's a lot of fish. So, do you work in and around the ocean? Like, is that your day to day job? What are you doing? Every day, because you're about. No, I'm a yeah. I'm a social worker, so I work with uh, teenagers. Uh, wow, that's yeah. what that's what my younger brother does. I was I I, I I pondered doing youth work myself at one stage. And then I was like, I didn't even like myself when I was a teenager, let alone <laughs> other other people's teenagers. Um, so is that a taxing job? Is it, is um? I know when I worked in civil service, uh, work with people a lot and broken people a lot of the time as well. Like the ocean, all of a sudden takes on a far broader appeal. It's almost like yeah. a, a must-have rather than a nice-to-have. Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty addicted to the calmness of the ocean. Kind of uh, gives me strength to uh, be a level head shift. There's time for me to go diving before work, and on the uh, and also in Norway, night diving is very popular, especially in uh, the winter because okay. the fish they go up and uh, in the shallows. So tell me about this podcast. You started it in sort of like late last year. And um, yep. obviously the, there's a lot of awesome things about starting a podcast. Like I think yeah. you and me were sort of saying like developing a network is pretty pretty fantastic and getting to pick brains of, you know, some amazing people. But um, I'd love to hear more about your inspiration and what you hope to achieve with it. Well, I got the idea from listening to Noob Spiro and I like to listen to all those stories about uh, – you know, like I get really fascinating hearing about those fish that I've never seen myself, and I think about how they taste, and I, I really like listening to that podcast. But also, I kind of miss uh, a podcast where I can learn more about the conditions uh, near where I live. So that was the initial idea. The networking thing kind of came. That was something that I discovered that when I interview people, I get to know them. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's a great thing because, like, uh, of course, I want to travel more yeah. in Norway and see all those places and, and dive there. I am, um, I have the same thing as you, and I mean, I'm two hundred odd episodes deep these days, and I've met so many people that I I would love to go and hang out with and dive with, but it's just like, you know, you get older, and you know, you know yourself, you have children, and it's just yeah. like there's so much more opportunity than there is time to um to yeah. to do it all, but um. You know, it's cool. How long ago did you start spearfishing? When I was uh, in my teens, my older brother, Bjorn, shout outs to my brother. He was uh, into uh, scuba diving and his club, they kind of started having this, uh, because that was like the first time it started becoming trendy with spearfishing in Norway. It's like in the 90s, 95, 96. So they had some courses uh in his scuba diving club for free diving. And I joined there and I went uh, with his dive boat, with their dive boat and on some trips and I started spearfishing then. So when I was 16, I also entered a a Norwegian championships. First and only time. And I won the junior category. Wow. But it wasn't like a huge competition. The competition in the junior class wasn't uh, really fierce. Like uh, 
I've learned using a spear gun the weekend before. So, but uh, yeah, it was it was fun. So, and then I just like uh, it kind of skilled away. I had all my equipment in the basement of my parents' cabin, and then like uh, two years ago, we just had a conversation about this. My my brother's wife told me that she had bought some free diving gear and she didn't have anyone to dive with. And I kind of said like a joke that my father's memorial fund would probably have some money for <laughs> to fix that situation. It was like a joke. And my mom laughed, but then she decided to buy us free diving gear. So wow. me and my brother and my sister, we all got this uh, free diving gear uh, package. And then I uh, was at the cabin. I uh, took out my old spear gun and I went into the tidal current like one minute uh, from the cabin and I, uh, like the, the the line was really, it was really old. Like I, I changed rubbers on it. Like the, the, the shooting line was really messed up. Okay. And I saw this big cod and I shot uh, after it and I missed and the shooting line broke. <laughs> uh, and I managed to get the spear, find the spear again and kind of tie it together and then, and I got this other uh or the cod, like a two kilo cod. Wow. And then like, uh, I went back to the cabin where my mother was and my, my girlfriend, fiance, the kids. And I was, it was a really great feeling, mm. you know, that whole, and I think that's when it kind of took off from there. After that, I've been diving as much as I possibly can. Mm. Yeah. It takes a bit of an effort when you have children and a wife and a job to maintain your spearfishing lifestyle. Um, yeah. you guys also deal with rugged conditions there in your winter, which is, which is now, um, yeah. and now you've, you want to squeeze a podcast in as well. Tell me about like what you'd love to see or, or the vision you have for where the podcast can go if you can. Well, I kind of gotten a taste to that whole thing with the network thing, because, mm. uh, the network is a great way of like, uh, discussing the whole sea and. We who spearfish, we are in contact with the sea all the time, and we care about we care about the sea. Mm-hmm. We want it to be uh, a healthy fish stock. We want to be uh, be enjoying that uh, the sea for many years to come, and our children as well. So, I think it's the opportunity to raise awareness mm-hmm. uh, about our our sea because, like uh, the Norwegian Sea, is also even though it's like a it's a country. It's not. It's it's a bit like New Zealand. We have like uh, five million inhabitants and like a huge, vast coast. Mm. But still, we have some challenges with uh, pollution and overfishing, and so um, I see it as an opportunity to spread awareness about the, uh, conserving the, the 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 sea. And also, I want to do some more projects. I want to uh, develop this whole concept with uh, the podcast, and also want to make some movies and. Wow! Uh, showcase the produce and and uh, get the local chefs to come in and prepare this uh, delicious seafood that we had uh, have here in the, at our doorstep. Yeah, nice. So yeah, and so connecting with people and yeah, exploring. So the average person that comes to listen to have have a listen to your podcast. I mean, obviously a lot of the time you're speaking in Norwegian, but yep. but uh, you do you're gonna you're planning to do some English episodes as well. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's cool. If there's going to be someone who's like relevant to spearfishing in Norway, maybe some, uh, people from other countries that have been here, that's interesting to talk to. My, um, yeah, I've met a few people from, from Norway, but I, my sort of exposure to it is Daniel Mann's videos and watching like, uh, Ragnarok on, uh, on uh, Netflix, which was, all right. right. Yeah. I don't know if you, (laughs) do you know the show? Uh, yeah, I haven't seen it. No, okay. like it's a little bit corny, but it's um, I really enjoyed it. But a lot of it is just how beautiful the place is. Like it just it seems pristine. Um, yep. Is that blowing up, or is it is it is it actually pristine? And, and what pollution issues were you talking about that need some more attention? Um, well, it's pretty pristine. Yeah, you can compare it in a lot of ways to to New Zealand and uh, probably especially the South Island of uh, New Zealand. We have the fjords. We have the mountains, uh, the sea. Like in in my hometown of Bergen, is you have the city, it's two hundred fifty thousand people, but outside of the city, just like an hour drive or a half an hour by boat, there's like uh, a lot of islands and yeah, wow. huge uh, amount. But like we have, uh, yeah, we have fish farming. They they are very pop. Uh, they were big in Norway. They are very powerful. Mm. 
you know, uh, and uh, a lot of the things that they have done is uh, is not good for the quality yeah. of this uh, the water. A lot of people um, talk a about places. a lot of people talk about like obviously when you have fish in a in a net, uh, you yeah. know, in a in a big cage, like they they're just shitting nonstop, and you have a huge amount of biomass in a very concentrated area, and their yeah. their their fecal matter can be very detrimental to the benthos and the, the you know the surrounding sort of flora and fauna and you know in in the ocean yeah. um yeah. is that kind of some of the issues you have is that the main part of it yeah you can see it like if you're going to getting near to a fish farm you can see it on the on the bottom it's uh it's it's dead oh wow wow uh, depends on the, of course the tidal currents and how the mo- uh, water is moving around it but uh, yeah but also, like it's a big thing. It should be kind of op- discussed openly, you know. Like we we're probably going to have fish farming, so we should be able to to discuss it more openly without the uh, the industry kind of uh, deciding what to say and not. Yeah, That's probably yeah. the most. Yeah. Like a lo- <clears throat> like a lot of sort of discussions that you have, like there's pros and cons, you know. Like it's fantastic that um that they're able to farm animals and create, you know, a lot of you know, probably arguably very healthy protein for people at a, at a lower cost and wild caught stuff. And they're not really mm. interfering too much with, um, with like, you know, overfishing local fish stocks. I mean, that could be some of the benefits, but yeah, it is nice to see the conversations had. And even by mm. lay people like, like me, because yep. I'm going to ask the dumb questions and someone's going to be able to tell me. And, um, mm. Yeah, I, I, I like it too. I, I think that's one of the good things about podcasts is you can just have the conversations. Yeah, and I can talk to people that know more about these things than I do. So mm. I can learn and the people who listen to podcasts can learn. How many people do you think or do you estimate spearfish actively? Because I, when, I, when I get asked to sort of cite numbers of spearos, I always kind of have three distinct groups. There's... Yeah. People that are just as passionate as I am and get in the water at every chance they get, and for yeah, me the that frothers. Might, yeah the frothers yeah, uh, <laughs> I, but like even though I I count myself as a frother, you know yeah. at, at the moment maybe I'm getting in the water twenty twenty five days of the year if I'm lucky, um yeah. I still count myself in that group. But then there's a, the secondary group where they live in parts of the world where the oceans are maybe extremely cold or filthy for half of the year so they kind of do it opportunistically or they just they use spearfishing as a complementary sport like maybe they go kite surfing and they do line fishing and they get in and they like to shoot some dolphin fish every now and then or something like that and then there's this other group of spearos I think of and they have all the gear but they actually never go and do it they just have a spear gun in the shed and they have all the gear but they they don't really ever get in and do it and I always sort of think of those three distinct groups so it's the guys that don't have a, have girlfriends that they won't let them go out. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> they get their uh, equipment and then, they, but they it's not so popular, you know. Mm. So my my girlfriend lets me go out and she loves seafood. So yeah, yeah, it's amazing, nice. amazing to have a hobby where you can bring something back that your girlfriend wants. Yeah, yeah, the most expensive seafood in the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yesterday we had like a, I've made this new dish. That's gonna it's a it's in English. It's called dill. You know, it's the herb. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I make like a pasta with dill and scallops. Ooh, that's a winner. It's really good. It's really good. Yeah. That sounds good already. How do you make it? Just just give us a quick run through before I return to. My it's early kind question. of it's a little bit kind of like a fusion because I use the the kind of Asian fish sauce. So I start with the onion and the garlic. And maybe like uh, some yeah paprika, or different kind of vegetables. And then I fry that in butter. Yep. And then I uh, add some fish sauce and a white wine. And then I put in the scallops. And yesterday I had some cod as well. I put the cod in and also the scallop roe, which yeah. is kind of uh, makes a good kind of umami taste. Mm. And then I fry that kind of in that mix for an, a short while. And I, I already boiled the pasta. And then I put some cream in at the end so it doesn't curdle. And Just, then I add the pasta to the hill and then fresh dill and green chilies. Whoa. And then mix it together. I'm coming to Norway to eat, brother. That sounds good. <laughs> um, yeah, you should. You should. 
Oh. It sounds like you love experimenting with the cooking, which is cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, uh, I'm big into, yeah, food, yeah. Hopefully we can circle back to some food stuff because it's one of my favorite topics. But um, returning to my earlier question, how many people do you think actively spearfish in, in, in Norway? Like how many frothers do you think you have? How many frothers? I, I haven't counted the frothers, but the kind of I know who they are. It's uh, We have this uh, on Facebook. There's like a, um, it's like a fangst and sikt melingach. It's like a, it's a place where you can show if you have a good catch. Oh, yeah. Uh, and you can tell what kind of visibility it was that day. It's really popular. So, like, if you have a, if you have a big fish, you put a po- picture of that fish, and everybody loves to kind of like, uh, yeah, to talk about the fish. It's a very positive vibe. You know, yeah. it's really fun. Oh, uh, that's cool. So on that page, like, it's I think it's around ten thousand people follow that uh, that group that page. Yeah. So I would say uh, most of them would, would spare fish, but you don't you don't know how much though. So. Yeah. Okay, cool. Interesting. And then But you get to know those the frothers, you get to know them kind of through that page. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Mm. is Facebook pretty big in Norway? Like are a lot of Spiros on there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a big uh, meeting place for the Spiros in Norway, yeah. Mm. And also we have some contact with like uh, the Danish people as well. Um there is uh, Swedish people, they go to Norway for spearfishing because it's illegal in Sweden. But uh, yeah. there's quite a few Swedes here in Norway who spearfish. It's illegal in Germany too, isn't it? Yeah. That's crazy. Like, does it does it make you just go, how does that happen? Yeah, I don't really know why. You know, there's some kind of different rules that I don't understand. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know what the, the deal is in uh, with Germany. I think there's a... There's a there's a few Germany German people coming to Norway to spare fish, especially in the north of Norway. There's people from every bloody country going there to spare fish these days. Like, um, you know, the it's just so iconic, the landscape and below water, you know, you have this huge, you know, ling and there's all you know, all sorts of amazing stuff going on there. Yeah. It's the halibut, yeah. They come for the halibut. The halibut especially. Yeah. Halibut. I, 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 halibut, yeah. I got the halibut this summer because that was the first time I went to North of Norway. Yeah. I went there with the family, so I managed to squeeze in some diving. So, yeah, I had a really beautiful dive there in, uh, in an island uh, in the north of Norway where my um, my girlfriend's cousin lives. So, yeah, I caught a nice 11 kilo halibut. It's not a huge one, but, uh, yeah, it's great eating. Really, yeah, really yeah. nice. So walk us through it. Like um, sometimes a lot of the videos i've seen they say like halibut hunting is like really you know like time consuming can be quite boring a little bit like blue water hunting and then sometimes you you're crossing relatively barren ground just looking for a silhouette basically is that pretty much how it goes or that was not the case for me at all it was like a beautiful beautiful day blue skies clear water really beautiful place like a beach on an island it's pretty close to the open sea uh so after i've been to the, like a via ferrata you know via ferrata the name sounds familiar it's like you, where you climb on a, and you clip yourself in the belt and you so it's ah. like a safe climb yep. overhang climb okay so i went there with my uh girlfriend and her cousin and her kids and i, I was kind of looking at the water all the time you know i was looking out and the sea was blue and so after we got down from that amazing climb, I got to get my dive gear and I swam out on that beach. And I swam out and in the north of Norway, you have these huge schools of cod. That's something you don't have in, in the south of Norway. So if you're from the south of Norway, you see a school of cod, you go mad, you know. it's uh, Yeah, so I was swimming out there and it was like uh, there was uh, hundreds of cod like around here you see maybe 10 and then you go wow but like yeah so it was uh it was so much fish everywhere and um but there was like a little parasite problem they have have up there this like a it's called kvais in norwegian it's like a parasite okay come from the from the seals oh okay so they said that all the cod there they have the parasite kvais so i just got one cod and i was thinking like i'll just I won't shoot any more cod because there's so many and they have kvais. So if maybe if there's a really big one, I'll do it. But uh, so I kind of was swimming along and I to see if I can find like a big safe or something yeah. like that. And then I dove down to like uh, 
uh, on this underwater formation to the like seven meters. And then I was just staring into the kind of crooked eyes. They have this kind of like the eyes that go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, yeah. And everything happened really fast. Uh, yeah. A uh, thousand thoughts in my mind at the same time, because, you know, I didn't know how big it was. So if it was big, you know, I, I would kind of probably struggle a little bit. I didn't have any boat or anything like that. So I was kind of lucky that it was 10 kilos. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, and so what did, like sometimes you see them, they're like uh, a porcupine. They have just, you know, like guys shoot them in a group and everyone sort of puts a spear into it and, you know, you see them swimming off with four or five shafts in them and they still keep going. How did that one go yeah. like in 11 kg? Uh, I shot it dead. Yeah. Oh wow. Dead. Yeah, and also uh, I stabbed it multiple times in the head just to be sure, <laughs> because I thought it might be bigger. Because uh, it was uh, uh, my my the shaft was stuck in the sand, mm. so I was trying to pull it up, but it was really kind of so. I thought it was much bigger than eleven kilos. Ah, yeah. So I stabbed it sometimes, and yeah, it was dead. And eleven kilos, it's no problem to get. Uh, 11 kilos is a big fish though. Like it's still a big fish. Um, have, where do you icky them? How do you find their brain? Is it, can you triangulate oh, yeah. from their eyes or how do you do it? Is there it's a kind of behind the eyes somewhere. Yeah. So yeah. that's why they're multiple eyes and uh, stabbing because I'm not hundred percent sure. You know? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there used to be a website. I don't know if it's still going. It's like ekgma.com and like, uh, he shows you, you know, skull x-ray shots of different fish yeah. and that way you can see where you, where you can icky them, you know, where their brain is. Cause sometimes a lot of the time going from the back of the eye and sort of down on an angle to their brain is really effective, but on a big halibut, I don't know where to yeah. stand. The halibut is a flat fish, you know, it's mm, like mm. a big, it's like the queen of the flounders, you know, it's a, <laughs> so they are kind of a little bit different. You call it the queen. But, um, queen of the flounders. Queen of the flounders. I like that. Yeah. That's cool. It's the it's the females that get the biggest as well. Okay. Uh, so the, like um, uh, in uh, um, my my uh, girlfriend's uh, parents, my girlfriend is from a uh, island just south of Bergen, mm. and uh, on twenty um, third of December, what's it called in English? We call it Little Christmas Eve here. The twenty third of uh, December. Oh, we don't have anything for that. I don't think. We just. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that day I went out for a dive uh, in uh, in the island which uh, where they live. It was like a beautiful winter morning, so it's kind of it's like a few below zero, and uh, it was clear blue skies, and it's kind of get this like pink light in the mornings and the evenings, mm. really, and the bo- uh, water was glassy. Mm. So I did like uh, a dive and just to pick up some scallops and stuff. I didn't have any expectations, so and uh, I was diving around this kind of uh what's it called when it's kind of like a, uh it's, it's a kind of a bay and i on the rocks there and i i was diving around yeah and uh, when i've been diving for a few hours i was kind of diving my way back to where i parked my car and then i dove down and then i see this huge monkfish monkfish yeah and then uh yeah everything got really fast from there i shot it and I pulled it up and I saw it on the arrow and it was, a, yeah, it was a 25 kilo monkfish. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it on your yeah. Instagram right now. So if people want to yeah. see this monkfish, it's huge. Go to Sundland 79. Um, yeah. And from that post, you can find the podcast Instagram, which is separate, separate, but um, yeah. mate, that looks like a freaky big fish. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got my favorite footwear on too. You've got a pair of Crocs on that. That is gangster. Yeah. <laughs> also starting to use in the, what's it called, uh, the dress in the kind of, uh, what's it called when you wear it in the morning and stuff, you're in, in a cape. Oh, like you know, a dressing have, gown? Yeah, yeah. That is starting rocking that now because it's really comfortable. Dressing gown. Winter cro- diving, yeah. Dressing gown over your 7 mil suit with a pair of Crocs on. Yeah. Jeepers, <laughs> man, you need a Spiro dad shit. That's about as Spiro dad as it gets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Like yeah, to... but the monkfish is an amazing fish. It's like uh, probably right now is my favorite fish. It's a uh, uh, you can only eat the tail because it's, it's it's kind of basically a massive head, a massive mouth. Wow, with a tail, and you can eat the the tail and the cheeks. 
uh, yeah, it's a really good fish. Do you uh, do you guys use the uh, frame and the you know the head and stuff for stock? Is that something you do there? Uh, I don't know if anyone does that, but you can probably do that if you have a large, large enough pan. Yeah, well, you need like a friggin' thirty liter, um, you know, saucepan or pot yeah. to be able to do it. But if you have a cleaver, you can you could chop that up pretty well. I'd imagine for stock, that would go really good. Yeah, well, I got some stock from that. Yeah, I was boiling some stock from that fish actually. Okay. My my uh, my mother in law boiled up some stock from that because uh, she they would sometimes help me with the uh, after work. <coughs> so I had some stock from that from from that um, monkfish. Cool. So tell me about it's hunting. Really good stock. Hunting them? Are they territorial? They look like they they would come and have a look at you. I'd imagine. It's like a really impressive fish. They look like a really dangerous aggressive fish but it's basically kind of a they have this kind of little antlers that they lure in fish smaller fish and other crustaceans and stuff with yeah so they lie on they kind of they have camouflage and they lie on the bottom and then a little fish comes by and they just rah, like that oh wow so they're an yeah. ambush type um... it's an ambush predator yeah so but for a for a human it's the they are slow and they are kind of like they're yeah it's not impressive to watch them uh, move around. Uh, <laughs> oh. so, so they have like a fast movement in them for capturing small prey. I thought they were yeah, really. Yeah, there's some videos with that on YouTube where you can see okay. when they ambush. Yeah, that's pretty. It's pretty quick when they go. Wow. Are they a yeah. deep deep water fish generally, or are they? Is are they often found shallow there where you are? Oh, uh, yeah, they're both. Okay. They used to fish them with nets in deep water. Yeah. So they are kind of both deep water and shallow water. So like you said, that was a 24.5 kilo fish and a lot of it's head, yeah. head and cartilage. I mean, what mm. would be your the yield of meat that you would get off that fish? I think it was like uh, five kilos of tail meat. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's still a lot of meat. That would have kept you fed for a while. Yeah. I just, uh, it's all gone now. So yeah, it's kind of. Yeah, it costs a lot of money if you're going to buy that in the in the shops. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's like uh, around 500 kroners a kilo, so that's like uh, 50 euro. Wow, yeah. wow. Yeah, that puts it in perspective. Yeah, it's expensive. Mm. Coral trout here can be similar price, particularly when you go further south to some of the more heavily populated cities. But yeah, yeah. that... Yeah, yeah. It's I, sometimes you hear the price and you're just like, "Wow, I'd never pay that." But then you realize, like, we're kind of spoiled by the access to yeah. the resource. Yeah, we are. Yeah, it's uh, for us. It's like uh, after I started spear fishing, that's kind of uh, that's the protein we eat. Mm. You know, so uh, yeah, my kids as well eat eat fish. It's like a big project for me to get them to appreciate and eat fish. You know. Yeah. So, yeah. But but it's, it has huge traditions here in our country. You know, everybody, everybody who lives near the sea have access to either a cabin or a boat or both. So yeah, it's like my my grandfathers and my my father was really into fishing as well, line fishing. Mm. So um, and my grandfather he used to go fishing in the fjord outside their house uh, to put f- uh, food on the table because uh, they didn't have so much money. So. That's awesome when you come from that kind of heritage, I think. It gives you an appreciation too for the environment and for what you've Mm. been given and for what you in turn want to give on to your children. So that's cool. Hey, buddy. How's your breath hole going? Really? You struggling? I do too sometimes. And that's why I've got something perfect for you today. I think you'll agree with me when I say that maintaining or even increasing your breath hold is a struggle, especially when you're not slaying fish every week. But what if I told you there was a way to train yourself easily and do it safely? Freediving for spearfishers at howtofreedive.com will help you to extend your breath hold, understand your body better, and put you in a better position when you actually get to go out spearfishing. This program, Freediving for Spearfishers, is not for noobs. Uh, it's for people who have some diving under their belts and understand basic spearfishing safety. But it's perfect for spearos who want a guided, easy to follow and complete program with videos, a clear process and a set goal. 
the goal is a five minute static. And check it out, free diving for spearfishers at howtofreedive.com. You can get started for free, do the taster, and if you do decide to purchase, use the code NOOBSPEARO, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O, to save some money if you do decide to purchase. Check it out at howtofreedive.com. Equalizing problems can be something that derail you. Not today, my friend. Go to freedivingfamily.com. Check out the, either the Frenzel and Advanced Frenzel video or the Mouthful and Deep Frenzel Equalization course at freedivingfamily.com. You can use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. These courses are put together by Adam Stern and a select team of, of, of legends and to help you overcome different issues and help you perform better. And some of them are extremely relevant for freedive spearing. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Kill fish with precision and power, sending shafts from a stable platform with Kill Shot spear guns. Made in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin, you're buying American made dependable spear guns. Get $30 off any Kill Shot spear gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Nuba. That's $30 off American made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com it says if they're in the shop or on the phone they can cash in by saying crikey mate or the noob spiro podcast sent me check them out at killshotspearguns.com based in the florida keys so you came across well your mother funded you know your is it your sister-in-law and your brother's first lot of equipment yeah, correct? my sister got the equipment from her. My sister-in-law bought it herself. But ah, okay. My sister and my brother also got the, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so ha- has everyone stuck with it? And I'd love to hear kind of well, when you guys... Well, they're getting there now. Like I got a message from my sister like a few weeks ago. She sent the message to me and said, uh, Hey, you have to teach me how to dive because so that I can uh, feed my kids, she said. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. I like that. So we're going to try and get her in the water and, uh, yeah, learn how to do it. Yeah. I think actually she'll be good at it. She'll be good. What do you think makes someone good at spearfishing? Uh, I don't know. I think uh, it's like in my family, it kind of runs a little bit in the blood because uh, my dad, uh, he was really into the ocean and he was a good swimmer. He used to catch scallops without any dive equipment or anything. He just had a dive mask and some stints. That's a pretty impressive, you know. It's, yeah. Uh, the water is cold. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and I, and me and my brother are also always been really into the sea and, you know, like swimming and it's, it's natural. Yeah. And I see my daughter now as well. She's got like a, she can do it. She can dive underwater, you know, and she, yeah, she's motivated. I think it's in the, in the genes. When you started learning about, you know, the physiology of what happens in our bodies when we go diving and you yeah. started learning some of the science and the physiological responses, like in terms of like the master switch and, you know, some of this amazing stuff that happens inside our bodies, did that yeah. kind of further confirm that sort of natural state for you? Or, I mean, what was your response to learning about it? Yeah, I'm really fascinated by that uh, aspect as well, you know, the mammalian dive reflex. Mm. Yeah, all the stuff that happens, you know, like uh, we were talk- I went on a dive yesterday and uh, we were talking about, you know, the the peeing. I don't know if uh, yeah. you do it. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I started peeing like a motherfucker. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's fascinating how all that stuff happened, you know, and, uh, and when you kind of learn a little bit more about it, you get more assured by it because you can feel that it's happening, you know. Mm. Uh, I was telling my girlfriend yesterday about what happens when, when I've been diving a while, you know, into the dive when, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm more at ease in the ocean. I get totally relaxed. I don't think about anything else. Mm-hmm. Everything I do, I move, you know, like I move kind of calmly and, uh, you know, like the, the current, you know, I just, I just understand it. I don't have to think about it. You know? Yeah. This is the problem too, with interviewing people and trying to pick their brains. A lot of it, a lot of the stuff is happening in our subconscious. And I think, uh, uh, you know, like, you know, we can use words like intuition and, you know, subconscious, I think. And not only that, sometimes we're starting to operate out of a different part of ourselves, you know, like people talk about getting into the sympathetic nervous system. And I feel like, I feel like sometimes spearfishing is like active mindfulness, like, you know, and I've said it before in, in previous podcasts, but I feel like it's like, 
our way of connecting with the environment and that that is what puts us in the state where we feel better when we get out of the water Mm. yeah but also you're being active and you're being outdoors it's like Mm. for me to be at the sea level it's my it's like my favorite place you know sea level and also in the mountains it's it's the most beautiful place to be and and uh, yeah, so it's it's just to have have a hobby where where, where you're at sea level. Mm. That's, that's also just that it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's so much to it. Like I'm starting to teach courses now, and we talk about bradycardia and you know all of these things like blood shift and how these responses grow over time. And the more you do it, it's like it becomes a better and better fit. The more you the more time you spend in the water. I think sometimes that leads to withdrawals, though, as well, when you're not at it. Um, how do yeah, you, yeah. How do you go temperamentally when you're not in the water? I'm usually in the water, you know. Like I've just made it work, you know. I uh, yeah. It's probably my my job, you know, so I can do it, you know. And if I can't do it, you know, like if I, some other commitment uh, comes up, I just make a plan for the next time I'm going to do it, and it's usually not far away, you know. It's a uh, I can squeeze it in, you know. Yeah. Uh, I kind of like my lifestyle kind of evolves around this now. Like uh, my car, I have a <laughs> electrical car, four by four with like a long range. Wow. So I can get in and out, you know, from the mountains and quickly, you know, with all my gear and out to work and everything is kind of like a little bit organized, you know. Nice. Sometimes when I don't have a, a lot of time when I'm diving, if I get a huge fish, I kind of, uh, get out of the water a little bit before, so I have a little bit more time, so I can drive by my mom's house and drop off the fish there, ah, yeah. so she can uh, uh, fillet it. Nice. And, uh, yeah, she's been complaining a little bit about you know when you have the huge cods, they are kind <laughs> of a little bit. Uh, it's hard for her to break off the head, you know, yeah, yeah. because they have huge heads. Yeah. You have to buy her a cleaver. Uh, yeah, I think she got one actually. Yeah. Okay. But like now the deal is like uh, if I hand it off. I have to already have broken off the head. Uh, that's the oh, deal now. Okay. Well, that sounds fair. Yeah. Well, then she gets some fish as well. She loves fish. And then she, she, she'll she fill the fish and put it like, nice into bags with like the name of the fish on. So I can just ah. throw it in the freezer when I get it. That is that is A grade. I love that. <laughs> I, w- I wish my mum was close by so she could do that. Um, talking <laughs> about family, my, my youngest brother, as I mentioned earlier, he – is also a youth worker and he yep. sometimes gets to take these young guys out with them. Um, yeah. And my brother's in a rural part of New Zealand down on the West coast. And, um, a lot of these youth come out of the Auckland area, which is six or seven hours South and further North and the North Island in New Zealand. And he, yep. um, he, he loves taking these guys out and getting them, you know, surfing, getting them spearfishing, getting, power and lobster and stuff like that. Have you tried anything like that with your, is it, are you able to do that with with some of the people you uh, work with? Yeah. Sometimes I manage to do that. Yeah. It's like, it's my favorite thing to do at work, of course, you know? Uh, <laughs> so when I get to do that, that's uh, when the stars are, are aligned, you know, even just like getting out fishing as well. It's also pretty cool. Mm. Mm. So yeah, I did it this summer. I brought a kid out and uh, yeah, it was a, it was a beautiful moment, you know, Mm-mm. we had like a little dive around there and then, uh, he was uh, had, he needed a little break, so we just uh, sat down on the rocks and watched the sea and uh, just talking about things. Cool. It was really nice. Yeah. Yeah, it is nice. Sometimes there's some people. What? Sorry. I was going to say sometimes with young men, like particularly teenagers, like you, you almost want something active to do together, and then sometimes you you can have the conversations um, yeah. around the activity, whereas like. Sometimes just a straight up conversation like you and I are having right now can be very taxing um, yeah. for teenagers. I mean, do you, do you sort of agree with that? Or, well, if I get I'm out fishing, you know, like uh, or diving or, or during activities in general, it's usually not taxing. Yeah, yeah. it's like uh, that's when they kind of uh, it's when the normal kid comes out for all the expression of pain and anger, you know. So it's yeah. uh, it's a very beautiful thing. Ah, yeah. that's very cool. Um, okay, so we've talked a bit, a little bit about halibut and uh, monkfish. I mean, you yep. got, you guys get uh, what is that other fish that bites people? It's a wolf fish, isn't it? Yeah, you get you yeah. hunt, do you we, hunt that regularly? We get them. Uh, yeah, they're not like a, a 
around here there's not it's not abundance of them anymore there used to be more of them yeah mm. so i i have sadly i haven't i've haven't never seen one while i've been diving okay so but i know they're around so and uh yeah but like i don't know if i what i would do you know, if i would see one you know it's a really tasty fish so so yeah you, uh, you hunt in holes a lot or you, do you prefer like what's your favorite style of hunting yeah hunting in hole is not a big thing in norway you know the the thing in norway is the the tidal currents um so it's usually like in the fjords they will have like little uh, it's where the current grows stronger around like a little uh i don't know it's like a a stream we call it like a strum that's where the it's maybe under a bridge a lot of the stuff under a bridge is very popular it's like easy to get to by car as well yeah so yeah like um uh our family has a cabin it's like a an hour drive from here and i have a boat boat out there so i take the boat out for like uh, five minutes and they into the tidal currents there and it's like a little uh, underwater kind of formation with a stake on it okay and around around that uh in that tidal current, there's usually quite a lot of fish. There's there will there will be a lot of pollock there, and also uh, cod, and and then the odd kind of other kind of fish as well, like John Dory even. Oh wow! Yeah. What do you call a John Dory yeah. in Norwegian? Sankt Petersfisk. Wow, that's really simple. Sankt Petersfisk. Yeah. Sankt Peter. Saint Peter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I've I caught a few of them like last year, and I was. Uh, I think it's a species that's invasive because uh, the water temperature is higher now. So that's uh, why we have them. Mm. I love I, that fish. It's a really great eating fish. Yeah. Uh, it's my kid's favorite fish to eat, I think. yeah. And do you get the spines in the same spot that uh, we have in the Southern Hemisphere? Is it the same? Yeah, I think it's the same fish. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so it's around those tidal currents. So, like, if you go to a tidal current, you have to kind of like figure out how that tidal current works. So that's like the whole. You have to kind of start working with the charts, and and you have to take all other factors into as well, like uh, wind and all that thing, you know. And sometimes you have to find out all, all those things before you can dive at that spot. Otherwise, you just be the tur- the current will just take you out. So, so you so, need to. Yeah. You, do you try and dive like the slack tide where the tide is at the most like least movement? Yeah, you can do that a lot of places. Like, but in my favorite spot, it's like you can't dive there at slack tide because uh, it needs to be more power in the in the ebb. Otherwise, there will be like a water flowing out and it, in the in the top one meter. So you can't dive there unless there's a little bit of force in the ebb. Ah, yeah. Wow. But then it, when that when that thing is perfect, you know, like then you can dive there. And at that place, there is a lot of fish. And like uh, in October, usually is in October around here. That's when you get the, the biggest pollock. And that's really like uh, this autumn we had so much fun at that place when they would have the perfect uh, tidal, cur- uh, tidal current uh, conditions and also nice weather, blue skies. Uh, and then we had like some huge, uh, yeah. Some five, five, six kilo pollock. Yeah. So this is part of the reason why you uh, started the podcast. Like you wanted to learn about some of the different conditions and stuff that you have in in Norway. Like, how do yeah. people feel about you sharing this information on a podcast? Are they? Are people? Are, is the spear and culture there protective of spots and learning local knowledge? I mean, how how does that sort of play out? Well, if you kind of get to know one, you probably they're probably quite helpful, you know. There, but they don't want you to tell otherwise. You don't you don't want you to tell other people. Yeah, and that's usually the code, you know. Like, uh, if I get a spot from someone, I can go there, but I can't tell anyone else. But I can I can bring someone there. Hmm. That's the code. Yeah, I try and tell people now that I'm teaching courses. Like, um, it's okay to tell people. Where, where you're going spearfishing, like your friends and family, just don't yeah. put it on social media. And, you know, it's it's okay if 50 people know about it, but it's not okay when 10,000 people know about it because, you know, it seems... Yeah, but that's like 10,000 people, uh, uh, 10, people, you know, really 
long coast, you know. I don't think it's a huge problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you need to, a lot of places. You need to have a boat as well, you know. Like, and when you need a boat, you know, like it's a, it's a kind of an effort. Like, I, it's a barrier. It's where I go diving, there's no one else diving there than me and the people I bring there. Who's been your favorite podcast guest so far? It's kind of a little bit hard to say because I've listened to most of them. Most of them. Oh no, not not on my like, podcast. Uh, on your podcast. Oh yeah, no, like I've, uh, I'm really happy with all the episodes I've had. Like, uh, I'm, I'm editing the fifth one now. Yeah. Wow. So, but they're all been good, you know. Like, uh, they're all uh, interesting people. That, uh, yeah, I think you should uh, maybe have a chat with them as well. Yeah, yeah, always. Uh, can. Yeah, but uh, um, there's uh, the guy, other guys, the just add water guys, the Orion and Ivan. I don't know. If yeah, you know yeah, yeah, about yeah. Them. I'm familiar yeah, with them. They're uh, they're cool guys. They have a lot of knowledge, you know, like uh, around uh, their area. They live in a city called Christiansund, and also it's the the Danish guy living in Stord. It's a uh, Mikael Bue. He's also really experienced spearfisher, um, and he's like the king of the turbot. I don't know if you heard about the turbot. I I've heard of it. Yep. Um, I'm just yeah. going to Google it while we're talking. Tell me about the turbot. A turbot is a flatfish. Okay, yeah. But uh, a lot of people say it's the tastiest fish in the in the North Sea. They don't grow super big, though. Oh, they get pretty big. Yeah, yeah. I think the record is like 17 kilos or something. Oh wow, that's yeah. huge. That's like halibut types size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's much more tasty than a halibut. Mm. And it's oh. it's hundred percent part of the flounder family, is it? Or yeah, it's part of the flounders. Yeah, okay. Cool. It's kind of like it, 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 around there. I think about you know, like there's some people that's really into like uh, flatfish finding. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of I'm a little bit more of a, like a pelagic. Uh, I go for like a bigger pelagic fish, but like because it's so tasty, I want to to get my. I answer them, you know. Uh, I've just seen them once. But, yeah. In Australia, we have a, a fish called the flathead. Have you have you heard of that? Yeah, I've heard it on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like this uh, ambush predator has a big mouth. Um, it's a it's a flat flat kind of fish. Like, and they um, but they're very like if you can see them, they're very. They're, it's pretty unsporting a lot of the time. Yeah. The the biggest thing is shot placement on the flatfish, like. The way they lay on the sand, like that's the shot you want to get. You don't really want to shoot them once they're moving because you, they generally, when they move, they move really quickly. So, oh yeah, you've got to get the right sort of angle on them so that you don't, you know, um, bury your shaft in the sand like you did with the heli bit. Uh, yeah, and then, uh, but really, like seeing them is ninety percent of the battle, and sort of knowing yeah. knowing where they're going to sit in the tide. Um, yeah. So it sounds like you've got so you got turbot, you got halibut. Um, what are some of the other um, flatfish you have there? Pop. I can't really remember all. Uh, you should ask those uh, Sparrow Hangout guys <laughs> for the English names of the. Uh, oh, you got a lot. Uh, it's a. It's really abundant. You know the one with the red dots. We call it Rösbatte. It's a uh, yeah. It's a it's flounder the as most well. One. Yeah, it's a type of flying flounder. Yeah. I'm just going to use my friend Google here. Um, uh, okay. It's still a, yeah, okay. They can get like, I think they can get like five kilos. So, yeah. mm -hmm. They're good eating as well. It's just so. a red spot flounder, I think, something like that. Mm -hmm. Or a European yeah. flounder. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, yeah, we have, uh, the, the, it's like, uh, some other ones as well, but, uh, yeah. But like, I'm not like hugely into that because then you have to, you have to swim across a lot of sand bottom. Mm. You know, and, like, and like you said, for me, like, it's a little bit more fun to, to like hide in the kelps and yeah, get the pollock and uh, cod. Yeah. So I was asking earlier about hunting techniques. So you, you, you sort of started talking about you like to study the conditions and try and figure out an area, and then you, your preferred style of hunting really is to um, swim out, find a likely sort of hot spot, and then you're mm -hmm. spending time on the bottom. Yeah, or swim around and like you have the like the pollock is very kind of uh, it's a very curious fish. So if you kind of swim down to the bottom and you kind of halfway hide behind a rock or something, if they can't see the whole of your body, they can't resist uh, having a look at you. 
So then, uh, yeah, the Pollock, you, you shoot them a lot of time when they come swimming towards you. Okay. Yeah. Are there any techniques yeah. in Norway that don't seem as common everywhere else? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I think the I think the the techniques in Norway is kind of a little bit uh, because we have th- there is a there is a lot of fish, so you don't really have to become so clever to get them, you know. Yeah, right. I think uh, that's probably because we don't use flashers and stuff um, much here. Mm. I think the guys in Arctic spearfishing do that a bit, you know, to get the big safe up, up, uh, up the a water little bit column. higher in the water column. So now you just uh, go to the hot spots. You swim out there and uh, look around. You know, uh, I remember. Uh, the, sorry. Oh no, I remember chatting to. I, f- I forgot his name. It slipped my mind at the moment. But in Scotland, like when they're starting to head out and chase blue water stuff, they're starting to play around with flashes too now. So I did the blue water thing. Uh, is that like when they go for the safe or the? Coldfish, oh, coldfish, yeah, coldfish was one thing he was going for for sure. Um, yeah. I, at limited success though so far. Um, yeah, it was a subarctic Shetland spearing with um, Josh Haley. That's right. Oh yeah. Um, and he was talking a bit about it. And uh, coldfish, I think, was there one of their targets. Yeah. Yeah, I got one uh, last, not like last year, but the year before on my Christmas dive at my uh, my in laws. Uh, I got a big coldfish at the same, almost the same spot as the as the monkfish that I got uh, last year. Oh wow! Was, so uh, close to open water. It was like no, no. It's like uh, it's around the fjord system around that island. Okay. So yeah, it was. Uh, it, there was not a lot of fish then. I was just swimming around, and then just suddenly there was like a a huge coldfish there. Mm. And uh, I remember that was like I was. Not so experienced then, so I was going to shoot it, and then the uh, the security was on, of course, so I couldn't <laughs> shoot it. And I was swimming up, and I was Safety. swearing, and uh, <laughs> and then uh, I swam down again, and I could see it kind of a little bit uh, further off into the. It was like a little kind of channel, and then um, and I was uh, it was really aggressive. It kind of was looking for food or something, and then I swam up again. Breathe up and then I swam down and then I shot it and it was like uh, close to eight kilos. Oh wow! So it's a big, uh, it's a big goldfish. We mm. don't get a lot of them around here, but like in uh, in the north of Norway, there's a uh, there's massive shoals of them. Like, okay. Uh, in what Saltström are... and near Buda, yeah, there's like a uh, huge goldfish. Yeah. What are they predating upon? A bait? I don't know. Probably little herring and stuff. You know, there's uh, maybe mackerel as well. There's a lot of mackerel here, huge uh, schools of mackerel. Like uh, from the spring and onto autumn, there's uh, mackerel everywhere. So, yeah. So the big uh, predators like the the saith and uh, and the pollock and the cod, they will they will eat those yeah. those fish. So yeah. you, you might see more of them in that sort of time of the year if you're in the right place. And I'd yeah. imagine if you're looking at electronics. You might be sounding around looking for that kind of show on the sounder, that bait show on the sounder, and then that might be a good spot to go looking for some of those species you're mentioning. Yeah, but yeah, no, but you don't have to do it. You just go to the hotspots and they'll be there, you know. (laughs) Are you following at Old Man Blue Dive on Instagram yet? Bert Calder, creator of the Old Man Blue Dive Gear is an absolute legend. They are people that froth on the sparing life and intentionally make super hard wearing and practical gear that will stand the test of time. Visit oldmanblue.com.au and check out a bunch of tough, robust equipment made by people that are just as passionate about spearing as you are. oldmanblue.com.au When you're starting to spearfish, there are a number of obstacles and some of them are financial. Doing a freediving course is something that I've always recommended on this podcast. If you can do a freediving course with a Spiro, even better. But some of us can't even afford that. I've got good news for you. Today, you can do a freediving safety course for free at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. This course is brought to you by Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. He's got a passion for helping Spiros to die safer, smarter, and have more fun as well. This freediving safety course is practical, 
and it's free. Check it out at freedivingsafety.com or go to noobspiro.com forward slash TED and you'll find it there as well. Again, it's a free course just teaching you the basics of freedive spearfishing safety. Check it out, noobspiro.com forward slash TED. I'm looking at your Instagram again and you've got a webs- uh, wetsuit on. I'm not familiar with the brand, but I really like the camo and it looks like yep. a, a, a warm suit. Uh, Frivan Skiv. How do I say Frivan Skiv, yes. Yeah. Ah, okay. Cool. Is that a local Norwegian brand? It's a uh, Norwegian brand, yeah. Okay. And what sort of? It's a big one, big one in Norway, yeah. Okay. And that's that suit looks pretty warm, comfy. Are you wearing a seven mil? It looks like a, it's just an open cell suit. Yeah, it's a seven mil. Yeah, I use that one all year. Those look now in the winter. I use a three mil mil vest underneath, and I got like thing thicker socks and. I use these like mittens, like three yeah. finger mittens. I've seen those. Yeah, yeah. Are they okay yeah. to use? Yeah, actually, not too bad. Like, but the first time you wear them each autumn, it's kind of a little bit weird because you feel your hands kind of floating. <laughs> yeah. But and then you get used to it. You don't think about it anymore. What about taking the safety off your spear gun when you're down at the bottom? Is it okay with the mittens on? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a problem because you have that one finger. Yeah, you know? yeah. And then these are these ones are in one mitten, so they're kind of keeping each other warm. I did a dive on Friday, a night dive. It was really cold. It was like far into the fjord, so there was a lot of fresh water coming down from the mountains. So it was almost like basically fresh water. That was cold. That was really cold. Yeah. Do you, do you get a thermocline so you get like fresh water on the top, salt on the bottom? Yes, depends where you when you are. If you're closing to the to the to the in inland, the more inland you go, there's more of a thermocline. If you go towards the sea, there's less of it because there is more water flowing okay. out from the sea. The visibility is usually a lot better as well when you get closer to the sea. In the fjords in New Zealand, like um, they they'll get that layer of fresh water on the top too, and they they have a phenomenon where they get um, Black coral, which is generally only found at a hundred meters and below, they they'll they'll get it in ten or fifteen meters of water. Do you have any unusual sort of phenomenon like that there in your fields? I don't know. <laughs> I've never seen, on the spot, I never usually man. I usually don't go diving far into the fjords. That's like a it's like a winter thing. Yeah. Because yep. uh in the winter, you know, there's a lot of species, especially the cod go into the fjords to spawn. So that's like uh, in the winter we go into the fjords and also if there's a lot of wind on the coast, you go further in and you find uh, a lot of cod on the on the night dives because then the, the cod will go really shallow. Mm. And not so big though, it's like, uh, but you can pick up like a, a two kilo one, you know, it's good for, for, for dinner. What are the... What are the fisheries laws there for spearfishing? Do you have to have a license? To, uh, are there any requirements? How do you learn the bag limits and? Uh, uh, there's there's no bag limits. Oh, okay. There is like uh, some p- fishes that have like a minimum requirement, like especially like the the halibut. You're not allowed to take them if they're like uh, under seventy five or eighty centimeters, I think, and also not over two meters. As, yeah, because then they are full of quicksilver because they're so high high up on the food chain. Um, is it oh mercury? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Wow. Yeah, quicksilver is not uh, an English word. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would have thought it was mercury, though, rather than quicksilver. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure, though. Uh, I'm, I'm Again, I'm looking up my my trusty thing here in Google just to find out about it. I'll have a bit more of a look into it. Okay, cool. So that's yeah. some of the rationale behind the size limits for halibut. But what yeah. you don't have bag limits, so... If I want to go yeah. and target Pollock, I can shoot. I can shoot ten. Oh yeah, there's no one who's uh, going to keep track on what you get. No. Okay, cool. So, and like uh, the Pollock is like a, it's a very abundant fish. There's mm. like not any active fishing on it from the industry, so it's, it's it's just a bycatch. So so there's huge amount of them. The Pollock is everywhere. So do you have do you have problems with Spiros taking too much or line fishermen taking too much? Uh, I don't think it's uh, anything against what the trawlers take out, you know. The, yeah, yeah. The big ones, yeah. Sorry to ask you a politically 
fraught question there. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> like, it's fine. I, I think sometimes, like, I, I, I say personally, like, I think, um, you know, bag and size limits are great, but I think if the, that's what informs your ethics and the decisions you make when you're spearfishing, then I, I don't know that it's as informed as it could be. Like, I think, you know, if you are a Spiro and you fancy yourself a conservationist, which I think hopefully all of us aspire to be, then we, mm. you know, we should know when we're taking more than we should and, and you know, respond accordingly. Like, for example, there's a fish here in uh, Brisbane. It's a black spot tusk fish. And the minimum yeah. size is... 25 centimeters i think or maybe it's 30 yeah. I, I think i think it's 25 for black spot tusk fish but you know most sparrows you talk to will say well you know we don't even think you should take them till they're you know like 40 45 50 because like if you're starting we can't there's a level of like you know empathy for guys that are starting because it's like wow i shot one and it's legal you know oh, yeah. and that's cool you know like we're not trying to take that away but when you've been doing it a little while, it's like, well, you should let it grow because it'll get through a few more breeding cycles. And, you know, there's just not a lot of meat on a minimum size fish and they're so slow growing. And so, yeah. you know, we would love to see, I think, some of those bag limits increased. But that's kind mm. of an example of it from from this area. I mean, when you guys have these discussions on your on the broader sort of Norwegian Facebook group, what are some well, of the... We don't we don't discuss that so much because like i think uh, the fisheries in norway is it's, it's quite well managed you know like uh, usually there's a lot of fish here so it's not really an issue most of the time cool so, well, that's a good problem i think this like the, the 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 laws you know like norway is not part of the eu i think uh, a lot of uh, it comes from that kind of protectionism you know we don't want uh european fishermen coming up here and fishing up our uh our coasts yeah so i think uh we are preserving the 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 healthy stock and uh, but like we see this dimin diminishing there's less fish now than it used to be so it's a bit worrying like and also especially like around the south of norway from the capital of oslo and out that through that fjord and fjord and and uh, on the south part, far south, it's uh, it's not a lot of fish. There used to be active fishermen a lot there as well. They used to, yeah, wow. Uh, there was huge communities also relied upon fishing the sea. But like, no, there's not any. But uh, you have all the factors. You have the, the the pollution. You have the runoff from the land. You, yeah, all those things that there's also in other countries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you share a border with Russia in the far north. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 But it's only yeah, a very small that. part. Um, yeah. So Scandinavia, are you guys not – sorry, excuse my ignorance here. Like, are you uh, are, are no Scandinavian countries part of the EU when it comes to fisheries management and commercial Well, fishing? Norway is the only one that's not part of the EU. Uh, I think actually Iceland as well. I'm not sure. Oh, that's ignorant of me. <laughs> no, that's, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know either. So um, – yeah. No, but uh, Sweden and Denmark is part of the EU. Mm. Okay, cool. But like, uh, they don't have the abundance of fish. Like Sweden doesn't really have that uh, big of a coast either. So, but yeah, but they say in Denmark uh, there's not a lot of fish left. It's uh, it's sad to hear that. You know, like the, from the Mikael Bjer, the guy from the that I interviewed on the post, and he said uh, there is not a lot of fish there anymore. Ah, oh, that's no good. No, and. Uh, so and, I I think the I hope that we can continue on managing the stocks well. Well, the North uh, Sea is like, you know, like it's got a reputation as being abundant. You know, like nutrient rich yeah. and, you know, like relatively yeah. sparsely populated, particularly where you are. But, I mean, Denmark might be a bit different. I mean, it's more open to Europe and, um, and it's probably available to a lot of them as well. Yeah, yeah. I remember I travelled across Russia twenty eighteen. And finished off in Latvia. Well, I didn't finish off. Yeah. I it made my way south and in, into France and Spain and carried on. But um, it, it was surprising how much like you find people that froth on spearfishing wherever you are. Like you know, I was near uh, uh, what's the oh the the lake in the middle of Russia, and there were spearows yeah. there that just like they love it. You know, like Lake Baikal. 
and they they love yeah. spearfishing. They go in the rivers around <laughs> there, and it, it's cool just to see it's thriving even in in places like that. So yeah, awesome. Yeah, we have a lot of them. Uh, you know, like Polish and. Uh, People from the Baltic states that come to Norway for work, and a, a lot of those guys are bear fishing here. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. They kind of become uh, part of the community. So shout out to them as well. You know, yeah. I want to maybe talk to one of them in my podcast to to all the guys that uh, from the east Eastern Europe who come here for work and spearfish mm-hmm. with us. Yeah, you, you might so, yeah. you might have to learn some Russian. Well, they. Hopefully they will know English or Norwegian. So, <laughs> the lingua franca. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, walk us through. So we were talking about the the wetsuit brand that you that, that's very common there. Um, yeah. What what does the rest of your gear look like on day to day spearfishing? Well, uh, usually most of my equipment is from that Frivan sleeve shop. You know, because they're they're the biggest on the market here. We also have some other ones. There's uh but they have the Havkong and, and Friedeka. They have some, they sell from a website, but they also have a lot of uh, good equipment. Okay. Yeah. So I got my stuff from there. Uh, all of it, most of it, actually. I bought some stuff from Havkong as well. So yeah, they make everything from like spare guns to wetsuit and uh, yeah, weight systems, uh, fins. Uh, yeah. And they also car- carry other stuff as well. Like uh, foreign brands. What's 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 your go-to spear gun? I got a free free one sleeve tactical carbon. Okay. It's like a one of one meter and five. Okay. It's like the all-round kind of uh, Norwegian. Uh, it's what what you're gonna meet in Norway. It's like powerful enough for that. Like, uh, well, you, I you... can shoot a halibut or a big uh, big cod with that with that one. Yeah. Well, you've already shot yeah like a twenty-five kilo monkfish, so it's clearly got some penetration power. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the the cod have really big skulls, you know. They uh, you need some power to get through that. Yeah. So you, um, spearing with the rig line and float flag. Yeah, yeah. Everybody does that here. Like, uh, I know some people that's tried doing the reels, but I don't think it's any good here. Okay. Because it's not really that much like deep diving either. So the 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 rig line is good here. Well, sometimes with the real guns, it's where you get into trouble was trying to spear deep with them because, you know, like if you've got 40 metres of line and you're in a little bit of current and you're diving yeah. in 20 metres depth or 25 metres of depth, you run out of line very quickly. You know, if yeah. a fish goes into a cave and the current's push, pushing you back, it doesn't matter how hard you try and swim on it, you can't gain ground. Like mm. your, your gun is underwater and you've, you know, like you're, you're paying for it very quickly. So I think sometimes in, in deep water, like a, a rig line and float is, you know, very good as well. Um, a lot yeah. of people skip that in their, in their learning curve these days and they want to go straight to a real gun. And I, I, yeah. I honestly think that everyone should start with a rig line and a, and a float. Um, yeah, maybe well, there's the boats, you know, if you, when you're diving under a bridge in the tidal currents, there will be both passing by, you know, and they need to see you. I think that's part of the reason why we use them as well. Yeah. Do you have like a, with the bridges that you're spearing under, is there like a channel where the boats will go and then, you know, like a large part of the bridge is like, or can the boats go through under at any point? Well, uh, that depends, you know, but uh, oh. mostly the, the, the boats are pretty oblivious, you know. <laughs> so, it's one I thing like in this... common around the world, I think. Yeah. I had like a, it's like, the, the tidal currents closer to my cabin, I usually go there a lot. And then in the summer, especially, there's a lot of traffic there. And uh, there were some kids that drove over me and uh, they, they had no clue I was there because I, I could see when I came up, uh, I could see that they looked really confused. You know, they were kind of, <laughs> that was, what was that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then they realized and then they kind of, sometimes they slow down and you can see them having a conversation. But a lot of the time, you just see them all turn back around and pretend like it didn't happen. And I've seen oh, that yeah. happen a number of times. Uh, well, you know, like you have the, when you're underwater, you can kind of tell a little bit from the sound what kind of boat it is. You know, like uh, if it's kind of like a high pitch kind of like uh, noise, you it, they tend to be a fast boat, and you know, you know they will pass you pretty fast. Yeah. So I usually kind of like I go up a little bit slower than I would, and then I will hold my spear gun up. Yeah. 
That's what I usually do. Are you familiar with the Doppler effect, though? Uh, no. What's that? So, like, the way sound travels out, out of the hull of a boat, like, if a boat is coming directly at you, often you will <laughs> never hear it because sound is dispersed, you know, according to the angle of the of the of the front of the boat you know all right and the way the sound is sort of and you know sound will travel amazingly in water but it doesn't yeah. travel predictably because of the just due to the the physics and the nature of the sh- shape of the hole and the way s- sound travels through it but yeah, yeah. I've, but I've, I've i had don't it. know where it's coming from but like uh, i can hear it it's, it yeah yeah oh yeah, yeah. I've, I've had it too sometimes you, and you come up and you know the boat's 500 meters away and you're like oh cool but then other times you're like, oh, wow, I didn't even hear that. And then sometimes it's much closer than you thought as well. I've had it yeah, all but like so If you hear it, sometimes you can just go up and have a look, you know, and you say, all oh, right, it's there, you know, uh, then you know how much time you've got. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, the beauty of having a bridge is you've got some structure you can possibly come up behind as well. And then, yeah. like, the boat's not going to be running into structure unless, you know, you're watching one of those te- <laughs> terrible <laughs> boating fail videos that everyone's seen on YouTube. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, when you're going spearfishing near car, um, structure like these bridges and stuff, you know, like fish love structure, you know, stuff that can provide them with protection. Yeah. Often line fishermen know that too, though. So sometimes you, I don't know, like maybe you're sparsely populated enough that you don't have competition for spots. But do you ever have the situation where there are line fishermen and you're sharing the same space? Yes. Sometimes, but I usually kind of uh, make myself known. I wave my hand, I smile, kind of like, uh, you know, try to make uh, make buddies with them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a good strategy. Yeah, Cause, uh, and also uh, like you, you're going to meet them after in the in the marina, you know, yeah. and you can uh, pick heads to find spots and uh, yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, sometimes I get a little bit like uh, annoyed, you know, like, why do you have to fish here right now? You know, like, uh, <laughs> I don't like, you know, that thought of like a, a hook uh, floating around, you know. So sometimes I, I, I think that they could move a little bit around, you know, like it's uh, the sea is for everyone. We have to, uh, we have to share it. Yeah. But also I find like uh, when I get up to the marina and stuff, the fishermen will be really interested in, in picking my brains about what I see underwater. You know, they they want to know where the fish is and I know where the fish is, you know, so. It's good when you can be friendly and and um, I think you can sometimes like that, you're the only spearfisher person that those line, fisher, line fishers have ever met, you know. And yeah, so yeah. you have an opportunity there to influence people. And yeah. the impression that they get from you as the only spearfisher person that they've ever met determines how they feel about the rest of us too. Oh, yeah, so. yeah. That's, uh, yeah. So uh, in my marina, you know, like I'm the only one there, so I'm the only one who's representing the sport there. Yeah, yeah. And I usually kind of, uh, sometimes I find like the their uh, equipment, you know, in the sea, you know, like the, the crab traps and stuff. Yep. And then I'll I will take it up into my boat and leave it uh, leave it at the marina so they can come and find it there. Oh wow, yeah, that's quite popular, you know. Like from a Norwegian spear fisherman, we we get those, you know, like the the ghost traps. And we pick them up and take them up, so that the fish and crabs and stuff won't die in there. Yeah, well, sometimes those their boys snap off. You get some pretty yeah. pretty big currents there, and um, yeah. So, yeah, um. What about scary stuff? Have you had anything scare the crap out of you when you're out spearfishing? Uh, well, uh, s- small stuff and big stuff. Like the most scary thing I've uh, happened to me was uh, last winter. I was uh, diving at a, n- a new spot because they, I didn't find any fish where I usually go. Mm-hmm. So I got onto the other side and uh, I went out in a marina. Uh, in the winter and uh, yeah and there was no boats there and and when i got into the water i could see that there was like a uh, huge chains hanging from the pontoons so i was thinking like uh, i won't clip my uh, spear gun into my belt because it's the all these chains i don't want to get wrapped up and then i swam out of the marina and i thought that uh, i was out of it all the way but and then i did a dive to around like 10 meters and i stayed there for like fairly bit yeah, a uh, fair amount of time. And then uh, I went up and, and there was a chain. So 
uh, the the shooting line entangled and I couldn't go to the surface. <laughs> so I had like a, a brief amount of time where I thought I was going to die. Wow. Until I just uh, <laughs> I managed to get it out of the belt. But I had like, a, I don't know, I, yeah. Uh, I had like a second or two where I thought I was going to die. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like uh, that is, uh, that is an uh, awakening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is what happens. We learn stuff from from it. So yeah. are you going to do the same things again? I mean, what have you changed? Well, like uh, I think after that time, I've tried to kind of like minimize the time I'm going out on my own, I think. Oh, uh, yeah. Yep. Because like uh, I've been listening to your podcast, and, you know, you had a, like a <laughs> episode about that diving alone. That episode was uh, it was spicy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like uh, you know, like uh, for me to dive on my own, I actually I I like it a lot. I love it me to too. be on my own. It's such a calm thing, you know. Yeah. Just to be around and and hunt on your own. But like now, I I minimize that, and uh, because of that, I've gotten a lot of new dive buddies, which is just like a yeah, it's a blessing. Yeah, yeah. It's uh yeah. There's there's beautiful. So I think that that's it. Yeah. There's mm. beautiful things about both. Like, and I, I, I that episode, you know, I felt like where I was being a little bit dishonest by always preaching buddy diving and never really being honest about the allure of diving alone. And I, I, yeah. I think like, you know, Pat and I tried to paint a picture of both scenarios and. These days, like, I like buddy diving more because often I'm more stoked when my mate shoots a fish than I am when I shoot one myself. And the other thing is, like, sharks too. Like, sharks are way less of a problem when you have a dive buddy. And not only do I do I have someone there when I'm yeah. coming up from a dive and we can also share, like, the cool moments and stuff. But the other part of oh, it... Oh, yeah, yeah. But the other part of it is, yeah, sharks. Like, they... Sharks are way less inclined to steal your fish if you've got an active dive buddy, you know, and mm. some of the diving we do, particularly on the east coast of Australia at the moment, like, oh, and the west coast too, this is a lot of shark activity, you know, and, yeah, um, you know, we manage the risk as best we can, but I think one of our best risk mitigation strategies is diving with a buddy. Like, it might not yeah. be such a big deal for you guys there in – it's yeah. not a deal at all. Uh, yeah. We don't have, <laughs> we have the sharks, you know, like, uh, but like not the, not the man eating ones. Yeah, yeah. What what do you know the names of the sharks in English that you guys have there? Like, yeah, the nine. I think it's like the what's it the the basking shark. Ah, yep, yep, yep. And do you get the and, seven uh, gill. Seven gill, no, no. Okay. Oh, cool. I don't know all of their names, you know, like because yeah, uh, yeah. like the it's the, but they're pretty pretty big, you know. In, in uh, there's someone it's one called Brigida. It's a huge shark. Ah, yeah. Mm. Well, those basking sharks are huge. They're like twenty five feet long. Like they're absolutely huge. Um, that, yeah, I can't big, imagine yeah. that'd scare the crap out of me if I saw that underwater. Oh yeah, especially if they come from the behind. You know, they'll be really scary. <laughs> Yeah, Even though you know it's not a danger when you when you first see it, like yeah, uh, I think it's like everything that's happening behind me when I'm diving is kind of giving me a, a, a scare. Yeah, it's even fun. like uh, sometimes when I'm doing a dive, and then uh, on the shooting the line behind me, there will be like a pollock, and if I'm diving and I'm swimming down, and then the pollock pollock drops down on the on the line and then it hits me in the back i go like <laughs> <laughs> i've had that too yeah yeah learn from the best adam stern's courses at freedivingfamily.com are written and presented by some of the world's best freedivers and most experienced instructors lessons learned come from years of freediving and teaching at the highest levels and are now condensed and available for everyone go to freedivingfamily.com and use the code spiro and you get 20% off any course. Now there's frenzel, advanced frenzel, hands-free equalization. There's mouthful and deep frenzel equalization, even by finning essentials. Get that finning technique right. It's the one percenters that make the difference in spearing and allow you to have more time on the bottom and you feel better even doing it. Go to freedivingfamily.com and use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Adam Stern's courses at freedivingfamily.com. I just love a functional and simple spear gun that I can trust when I pull the trigger. 
Kill Shot Spear Guns utilize the finest of kiln dried Burmese teak. Kill Shot Spear Guns also combine American made parts and fine craftsmanship to bring you accurate, reliable, and simple spear guns that you can trust. Fish after fish. Get $30 off any Kill Shot Spear Gun at KillShotSpearGuns.com. Yes and amen, Uber. That's $30 off American made performance spear guns at KillShotSpearGuns.com. I'm really sorry for this terrible accent. Brought to you by Ed Martin at KillShotSpearGuns.com. Um, funny stuff. You like to have a bit of a laugh. Yeah. What's one of the funniest things that you've experienced out spearing? I don't like, there's like little things, you know, like, uh, there was once I was diving in the current and, and I saw this cod and the way it was swimming and the way it was moving kind of, uh, reminded me of this kind of like, uh, East European puppet movie character. <laughs> and it was kind of like, uh, yeah, or like a, a little bit like a dog, you know, when he was swimming along the bottom there and he kind of crossed and then he disappeared behind a little underwater structure. <laughs> Those little kind of thing cracks me up. Uh, and also like when I, like I told you, when I got the halibut, you know, like the whole thing was kind of funny. Yeah. You know, like the, the kind of look that it gave me, you know, like when, when before I shot it, it was like, a, it was shocked, you know, it looked a bit <laughs> kind of like uh, in disbelief and anger, you know, before I... <laughs> So yeah, I think so. I also try to I try to avoid the shitting, you know. Yeah, like you talk a lot about shitting. Ah, we a, always uh, try to avoid that. And like uh, early on from just that water, he said like he always drinks coffee in the morning. Like he likes coffee. That's not just because he he wants to shit. You know, <laughs> you want to do that before you go diving. Yeah, because yeah. you don't want to go and shit when the water is that cold. You know, you don't want oh, to do that. No way. Like you're not taking your wetsuit off to do an aqua bog when you're in. You know, nine degrees Celsius water, like it's just not going to happen. You're going to have nope. to, you're going to have to swim ashore and do an awkward half squat in your wetsuit and probably get yep. shit on your wetsuit and your booties. Yep. It wouldn't be pretty. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> so. Before, when you were talking about just observing stuff underwater and then you, you know, like you, you know, you have a comparison with like something on earth, on land, you know, like something funny that's just funny to you. These yeah. are like mental observations and you can have a good time. And yeah. trying to explain it to others, it's kind of like, you know, one of those you had to be there kind of things. And it's almost like people have to, you know, in order for them to understand it, it's actually quite complicated. And I think when yeah. you go diving, a lot of our experiences are like that. They're hard to put into words so that other people can go, oh, you know. And um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I get that. Have you lost a friend in current? Uh, not like, uh, it's been taken out like a couple of times when I've been to that, my, my car, my favorite current, a couple of my friends have gotten taken with the current there. And, but then I've always been like swimming like hell into the boat so I can go and pick them up, you know, because they don't know how, you know, so yeah, I don't know how far it would take them. Or it would be kind of a little bit crap if I didn't get the boat started. And stuff, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, that's cool. Last time when I was in Western Australia, uh, I was diving with Bert and Joel, and um, yeah. we were diving the edge of this island, and for whatever reason, like, it had ended up with Bert was, you know, 500 metres one way, and Joel was three or 400 metres the other way, and I was smack bang in the middle. And I swam yeah. my a fish back to the boat to, to put it in the boat, and then I got on the deck and hung my spear gun over one of the cleats at the back, and I looked up and realized how far away both of the boys were. And I thought, this is no good. Like, we're a long way offshore. Like, I'm just going to pull the anchor and go and pick the boys up and we'll we'll yeah. sort out where we're going to dive together again. And um, yeah. I started the boat, pulled the anchor, mowed it up, and forgot my spear gun was hanging over the back. And, uh, oh. and it went straight into the prop and just popped both the rubbers. I lost the shaft. And I smashed the barrel. I, luckily, I didn't damage the prop. Um, yeah. But, yeah, that was that was a, a bad one to forget. Like, I, I think I'm always just going to unload my spear guns now and put them over before I, I'm not going to hang them off loaded, you know. 
Because it's like yeah. it takes you 30 seconds to unload and then reload a spear gun. Like, you know, just don't be lazy and just do it pretty much is what, what I learned from that. Yeah, you have to, uh, you always have to keep an eye on the spear gun and also a little bit, you know, like keep an eye on where your friends are because like yeah. uh, I find sometimes when I'm out diving, like they, they just come up straight behind me and I don't know, even know that they're there. So <laughs> you, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> it's like some people like, you know, you should, when it's loaded, even though the, the security is on, yeah, it can go off. It can go off. Oh yeah, I don't trust it. I never trust it. Yeah. All right, Oystein, Oystein, Oystein. Am I saying that all right? Yeah. I've probably forgotten. Oystein, yeah. Oystein. Um, <laughs> let's do Spiro Q&A. It's a faster-paced round of questions to head on out. Um, are yep. you ready? Yep. All right, cool. What is the single best piece of advice you've ever been given for spearfishing? Uh, stay calm. Stay calm, yeah. Just, uh, just don't use a lot of energy. Just, uh, yeah, that's it. Huh? Cool. What is the spearfishing destination you would most like to go to? Uh, there's a lot of places in Norway I haven't been yet, you know. So uh, I would really like to go. Uh, and I was actually going there this year, I think, back to Salztrauman. Yeah. Mm. And also we have Finnmark as well. There's an island called uh, Sörreja. It's a south, south island, actually, ironically enough. Wow. There's a lot of fish there. It's a beautiful part of the country. It's a big thing. I have to bring you back, yeah, bring all the back, the fish, so you have to organize a bit, but yeah. Mm. But also I would like to try uh, maybe the Azores or something like that because I would like to try to dive with uh, a thin wetsuit. I would like to know how that feels, you know, mm. to three mil and not a lot of lead. I would like to try that. Oh, it's so liberating. When I go and mm. dive cold water and I have to put on a thicker wetsuit and more weight, I I realize how good i have it most of the time like if you yeah. if you are uh you know if you're a 15 meter diver in uh cold water with a thick wetsuit you know like you're gonna yeah. dive 20 meters like it's just nothing you know and you're yeah. just gonna yeah. feel comfortable mm. during how many years have you been spearfishing now well it's like closing into two years now okay so yeah so during your two years spearfishing what is the yeah. b- biggest lesson you've learned? Um, always like keep keep the equipment uh, in check. You know, you need to have uh, everything in check. You know, the, the the spear gun should work. You know, you have to you should keep uh, an eye on your equipment. I always do that. I always uh, have it. Always works. I don't uh, miss out on that. You know, mm. for a lot of reasons. Always have a knife. You know, like always have a yeah. Be prepared. All right. Last question. Um, could you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in one or two sentences? Yeah, it's my go-to place for uh, for uh, appreciating nature, and also it's a uh, it's where I get my protein from. You know, I feed my family from uh, the stuff that I catch at sea. So yeah, it's a satisfying uh, lifestyle. I am a a wild man. You know, I, that's what I discovered. <laughs> I'm a wild man too, brother. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Mate, it's awesome to be able to pick a Norwegian wild man's brain. And uh, it's been yeah. awesome to have you on the podcast. Um, yeah. Tell, can you tell people where they can come and connect with you and listen to uh, a Vav Kontorut podcast? Yeah. Everybody who knows the Scandinavian languages who check out Hav uh, Kontura. You can find it on all the platforms for uh, listening to podcasts, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and also you can uh, hook hook up on um, on Instagram and um, and Facebook on the Half Contura page. I've got things planned, so it's uh, really good to get have you all uh, on board. That uh, means all the people in Norway, all the people in Sweden, Denmark, uh, yeah, all the uh, Finnish people who speak Swedish, and also. Uh, I would like to have you all into the community because uh, we have a, a, a common, um, we have something in common. We need to be together and protect the ocean. 100%. Yeah. If people go to um, noobspira.com forward slash um, Oystein, Oystein, it's O Y S T E I N. I'm going to link up um, his social media and podcast there. 
Come and give them yeah. a follow. Um, it's awesome to have another podcast in the space and, um, you know, like. Can I do a shout, a shout out? Of course you can. Yeah, I want to do a shout out to all the guests on my podcast, uh, Elisabeth, Mikal, Orion, and uh, also Andrew Hoopland, the lion fisherman. Um, and also on the next episode, everybody should, uh, it's a Saltström and special with uh, spearfishing guide, uh, Jörn Inge Amundsen Selster. Okay. It's going to be a cracker episode because uh, Saltström and is uh, the coolest place to go diving in Norway. Ah, sick. So yeah, people should check that out. Awesome. And also Frivan Sleeve, Havkong and Fredrika, all the all the people in Oslo and the east of Norway do apnea. We're gonna we're gonna make a podcast with you guys as well. Yeah. Cool. Mate, sounds like you've got some right. good things in the works and um awesome to have you on the show, Oystein. Yeah. And, uh, Thanks for the opportunity. It's really nice to say hello to the spearfisher community in the whole world, you know. Cool. And if you yeah. ever want to pick my brains and have me over there, I'll be more than happy to do so. Yeah, you're welcome to come. Uh, yeah, we'll take you out. I have to. You've made me feel terrible now. Like you've got better podcast mics than me, and you've only just started. <laughs> <laughs> All good, yeah. fella. Thanks for coming. Bye bye. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed Oystein Oystein today. Uh, Oystein Sunderland. Um, fantastic bloke, really enjoyed chatting with him, very down to earth and uh, if Norway wasn't on your hit list of spearfishing destinations, I'm sure it is now, check out his podcast as well, Have Conture, uh, or just check him out on um, Instagram, it's H-A-V-K-O-N-T-O-R-E-T and um, yeah, go and follow that guy, he's doing some cool stuff, they shoot some really interesting fish and uh, next week we've got a fantastic interview uh, exploring some innovation in our free diving and spearfishing world, with, I'm chatting with the creators or come on, some of the creators of Dive Butt. It's uh, the dive computer reimagined pretty much, and uh, it's far more convenient than something on your wrist. So come in. I hope I've, I've, I hope I've intrigued you. Come back next week, Dive Butt. The uh, Alexi and Landau join me, and uh, it's a it's a grand old chat. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the show, love the support from the patron legends helping to put fuel in the, in the Noob Sparrow outboard. If you want to consider doing that yourself, go to patreon.com forward slash Noob Sparrow and join a bunch of other legends doing that. Otherwise, thanks very much for listening, guys. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. See you next week. Are you looking for spearfishing gear in Australia? Head on down to your local Adreno Spearfishing Superstore today and explore their ginormous stores filled with mad gear and frothing staff on top of a huge selection of high quality australia price match guaranteed spearing kit and high quality experts bureau staff adreno offer afterpay and a super easy returns policy adreno will have you geared up for your next spearing sesh with a massive smile that's adreno spearfishing with stores located in perth aspley Wollongabba, brisbane the gold coast sydney melbourne Get into it. Head in today or shop online at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save $20 on every purchase over $200. Online or even better, in store. Your new spear gear is waiting for you. Absolutely mint customer service. Specialty spearfishing equipment, elite spear gun performance components, unforgettable reliability. You want to find out where to buy this? Punchandneptonics.com and shop at the best US spearfishing store, naptonics.com. Free shipping to the lower 48 when you spend over 199 and you can use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. This is your chance to save DOSH, buy deadly good gear, and experience A-grade customer service. Will you shop with the best? Visit naptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to start shooting 35-pound muttons tomorrow. Actual performance may differ from advertisement. Please refer to terms and conditions to see if you're eligible to be a legend like Shrek. This advertisement was not even endorsed by Jerry and the team at Neutonics. Hoorah and God bless America. Hey guys, not sure how you stay hydrated out on the boats on those long days out on the water. Uh, but staying hydrated is absolutely critical to Gord's good equalization and looking after your body, making sure you're not doing those awkward one-legged kicks to the surface when, when one leg cramps out on you. Go to aqualite.com.au, 
and get yourself a box of sachets. You just simply add them to water. It's less than $1.28 per serve. It's cheaper and cheaper and healthier than any other sports drinks on the market. Aqualite will make a difference in your spearfishing. Check it out at aqualite.com.au. Use the code NoobSparrow to save 10% on any order. Check it out. Aqualite, made in Western Australia. Mm-hmm.